And I'll just share with all of you um, how Yoke and Abundance started. And well, it started because I was blogging. And at the time I, I was in a job in corporate America for a Fortune 500 company and I had no idea. Well, I, I was not super happy with that course. It was like one of those things where a great job, someone else, but for someone else, you know, like all of those things. And I had had a blog for a while. The blog was called Wearing Many Hats because I wore a lot of hats. I was a yoga teacher. I was an athlete. I, you know, I loved to ride my bike. I loved to run. I loved to um, build community. I helped start a nonprofit in town. Um, so, and, and I worked a full time job. So I felt like there were all of these hats that I wore and, um, and maybe not a through theme of them, but there came a point where I, I was about to, I had been running the yoga studio for a while and I was, I loved the blogging piece. And I knew that I was not going to continue on with the yoga studio. So this was maybe like six months before my business partner and I had a conversation about shutting it down. And, but I just knew in my heart, it wasn't sustainable. And I loved the writing piece. So I just thought like, okay, let's level this up a little bit. So I had um, a friend revamp my website and I decided to name it Yoke and Abundance. I wanted to marry the things that were important to me. So yoga was still important to me, um, that like eightfold path. So for those that don't know that much about yoga, it is like an eightfold path of life. It's not just the asana. It's not just a physical practice. The word yoga means to yoke. So um, to yoke, I think of it like, an oxen. So everybody's like, where does the name yoke and abundance come from? Right? Well, when, so my family were in my dad's side of the family, they were farmers. Right. And, um, before there were tractors, you plowed your field with horse or ox. Right. And so my grandfather had horses that would plow the field. What goes over the horses, what goes over the oxen, it's a yoke. Right. So you could think of this as a negative thing, or you could think of it as that we all have a yoke to carry. And hopefully you figure out how to choose your own yoke. Um, but what's really beautiful is that is a tool that we wear to bring things together. So in yoga, I think of it as the, the, the yoke is the breath. It marries the mind and the body. It brings the mind and the body together for that period of time so that we can accomplish a task. So, you know, I'm a coach and to me, it's, it's important that we intentionally choose our yoke. So yoke, and then it's important that we live a life of abundance, um, that we, we cultivate that. That's something that we can cultivate. So that's where the name came from. So I'm writing blog posts under this name, Yoke and Abundance. And I have this experience where when I opened my yoga studio, Less than six months after I opened the yoga studio, another yoga studio in town opened less than a mile from my studio. And I'd done a lot of market research, you know, like I had not expected this other yoga studio to pop up and they seemed like they had a bigger budget. They did a huge announcement in the business journal that there's no way I could have afforded to do. They were members of the country club, you know, like it was like one of those things where I'm like, oh man, like I'm never going to stack up to this. So outwardly, I'm reaching out to them. I'm saying, welcome to the community. Thanks so much for being here. I'm glad you're here. And it's not that I didn't mean those things. I did mean those things, but also on the inside, I was the green eyed monster. Like it was ugly in there. Um, and that's not a place where I wanted to sit, but I didn't know what to do about it. Right. Like I was like, okay, I might be feeling these feelings, but I was starting to shut them down. And in, in raw, I talk about this a lot. Like our feelings are never wrong or bad, but getting stuck in those feelings are. And when you're stuck in those feelings, it's like pushing the beach ball down. And guess what? When that beach ball comes back up, it's a big problem. Um, yeah. And it's okay if the beach ball sits on the surface because you can like bat it around. So, you know, I'm also a positive psychology practitioner. And this was before I became a positive psychology practitioner. And I like instinctively knew, thankfully, 
before even taking my positive psychology courses that, okay, I got it. I have to proactively do something about this to fix it. So I thought, okay, I know some badass, talented women. Why don't I just, maybe there's something for me to learn here. Like maybe I just need to celebrate other women and maybe that will help me not feel like a jealous green-eyed monster of the yoga studio in town that is doing clearly much better than I was doing at the time. <laughs> so, so that's where the initial blog interview came from for the Yoke and Abundance series. And it was a blog interview. I had a standard set of questions that I would ask every single woman. And I published it. I called it Wise Woman Wednesday. And I published it every single Wednesday. And eventually I had, I asked that studio owner to be a feature on the wise woman Wednesday interview. So she eventually was somebody that I interviewed for that. She's never been on the podcast or uh, yeah, but I interviewed her. So that was a big thing for me. Um, and you know, what's important to me about that story it is that it is okay to feel our feelings, no matter what your feelings are. It's the, it's the getting stuck in them. That's the problem. And then the other piece of that story is that, you know, women can get a bad rap for being catty and jealous and whatever, but I don't think that that's normally true. I think that when we start seeing that in other people, it means it's something that's going on with, with ourselves. So we are a mirror of each other. So if I'm feeling something negative towards someone else, it's probably because it's a mirror of something that's happening within me. And do I want to be, do I want to try to blow out someone else's candle? You know, like that, that's a quote, I don't know who said it, but like, it doesn't make your candle brighter. And so to me, I wanted to be that one candle that light, that lit a thousand other candles. I didn't want to be the candle that snuffed someone else's candle out. And so that's where this was originally born. And that's what this is all about. And then it has turned into things beyond my wildest, wildest imagination, to be really honest. And so it started with it started with the interviews and then it went on to the panels that we would have in person. And then it turned into the podcast. And here we are. We have a huge community of women raw. And it's really beautiful. And we support each other every day in our morning practice. And, um, and then we have time to share and be present with one, with one another. So that's where all of this came from. And so I'm over the moon to have three women who have all been on the podcast already um, and done solo episodes with me. And each and every one of them are brilliant. <laughs> and have such bright lights and they do a lot of lighting of other women's lights in everything that they're doing. And, um, and they're wildly different. So um, the three women that I've chosen tonight, there, there was no theme, but as with all wise women panels, I'm sure a theme will emerge when we start talking. And for me, that's the fun of it. So I'm like, ooh, what's the theme gonna be? Um, the, the theme is just that we are all women and we are all here together and we'll see what emerges from that. But um, I'm going to begin by, uh, so it, I've got Sharon and Karen and Anessa, and I'm going to ask each of them to share who they are and what keeps them busy in this world. Um, Anessa, can we begin with you? Sure. So, um, Again, my name is Anessa Fike. Nice to be here with you all. And I am a Virgo. I start with that because I am a tried and true Virgo. Um, pretty much whatever is written about a Virgo, I am. <laughs> uh, good and bad. Tell us and, a bit, Anessa. What's a little bit that so, we should Yeah, so like Beyonce is a Virgo. Um, so we're very perfectionist driven. We're very ambitious. We're loyal we speak out, um, we have a plan. So we're very type A a lot of the times. And um, we, we want to provide things to other people. So we are loyal to a fault. Um, we will stand up for people to a fault to our own detriment. 
And um, just really, I was actually chatting with Alicia last week and things like mercury retrograde really mess up Virgos. <laughs> so when 2020 had more than normal amounts of mercury retrograde, it was a, it was a year. Um, but then to boot, I also am a, um, a wife of, gosh, I have to think about 14 years this year. And I have a almost seven-year-old son. And I um, am also in the people operations, HR and talent business in the tech sphere. And so um, I promote diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equality, along with other areas of people operations um, to more than 50 startups across the globe. And I have my own business. I've had my own business for eight years. And um, I have taken it, I've it bootstrapped it. I built it from scratch and I've grown it into a multi-million dollar business in that time. And um, that is what keeps me busy most days is my business. It's my other baby. <laughs> and, um, and my lovely husband is a mega feminist and um, is actually homeschooling our son while I run my business. And so he's also in the HR field, but left his role to actually join me in my business January last year. We didn't know the pandemic was going to happen. So <laughs> he quickly converted to being a homeschool teacher of our son. Um, but that's that's what keeps me busy. And a um, little bit about me and just to add a couple of additional things. I love great shoes. I love fashion. I haven't been able to get dressed up during the pandemic or wear nice shoes. So that. <laughs> Like it really, really makes me my some of my creativity is what I dress up in and what I wear. Um, and I love red great wine and I love eating at great restaurants. So I can still get the great wine. Uh, <laughs> I can take out the great restaurants, get take out. Um, but I'm also a reformed extrovert. And so what I mean by that is I used to be almost entirely 100% extrovert. And I've, over the last couple of years, as I've gotten a little bit older, I have really found that I still get my energy from people, but I do need a lot more alone time to recharge. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit about me. I'm excited to be here. Vanessa, thank you so much. You're welcome. Karen, could you tell us a little bit about who you are and what keeps you busy in this big world? Hi again, everyone. Yes, you know, um, I was kind of tearing up a little bit when Alicia was talking because, you know, I just being on your podcast and talking to you and, you know, watching you over these past few years with Yoke and Abundance has been really beautiful to see. And I also relate to sort of, um, you know, closing a business, have the people's perk and realizing it wasn't sustainable having those feelings inside where it's like well am I a failure like you know did I fail um and really kind of recognizing that when I when I decided to close it in 2019 I put a video on Facebook and I I because I, I was going to write something to let my you know, customers know I was closing and that just didn't feel right. And so I did a video and I kept crying and I said, you know, I'm just going to cry in the video. I'm just going to post it. And I sent it to a friend first and they said, yeah, it's, it's raw, but it's honest. And yeah, you shouldn't do a written statement because that's not the type of, you know, business you had. And, you know, after I posted it, the outpouring of love and support, it really like, it saved me. Like it, it let me know that, that this was not, this was just a physical space that I was closing, but that all the people and the connections and the things that we had done together in the community, that that was going to continue, that those folks were not going away. It was just this physical space that was closing. And that was really important for me um, to recognize like that simply because this phase was closing that what I had done was, was a success. And I think for me too, it, it just, I felt um, a sense of, of affirmation 
from that. And so what, what keeps me busy now is I've kind of refocused into art making. I went on retreat to two monasteries immediately after I closed for meditation and prayer and time alone and rest. And I had had that just that previous July, and I think I talked about it in the podcast, Alicia. I had the opportunity, and I, I think when I did the podcast, I told you I had to apply yeah. for a scholarship. And I got a scholarship to attend Penland, um, the Penland School of Craft in Western um, North Carolina, which is a, a like an international retreat center for creatives. It's been around 100 years, started by a woman, uh, very uh, intense in, in pottery craft and has really just grown to all the fine arts. And I got a scholarship to go. And that two weeks was just transformative. Um, in fact, during quarantine, because I had, um, uh, let me let me tell this, you know, figuring out what parts of the story I wanted, I keep wanting to jump to other parts of the story. After I came back from retreat, and because of my Penland experience, I had the the drawing uh, art, the artist there who who led the class. At one point, when I was struggling, he came up to me and he just said, "May I draw with you?" And I looked. I said, "Oh, yes." And he worked me through this moment, helping me draw, just, he drew something and then he, and then he had me draw it. And he really helped me process my emotions and work through something just by the simple act of asking to draw with me. And when I went on retreat and I was, I was in Kentucky and I thought, that's what I wanna do, I wanna draw with people. It was a liberatory like experience for me. And I just started, I went to the co-op. I started just inviting people to draw with me. Um, the co-op didn't stop me. You know, they just said they loved it. In fact, the manager wrote me a, a letter of recommendation for a grant, you know, that I applied for. So- And by co-op, uh, you mean our grocery store? Co yes, <laughs> yeah. I do, the Deep Roots. I'm sorry, Deep Roots Co-op here in Greensboro, North Carolina. It is a, a Greensboro's only community-owned grocery store, so it's a cooperative. I am a um, an owner, consumer owner there. And from that, you know, I just, I've done, before COVID, I did about, I've done 60 sessions. Um, and I was affirmed in my belief that everyone fundamentally has a creative spirit. And my goal is to liberate, affirm, and encourage that in every person. And so even with, with COVID, I've still been interviewing creatives online um, and posting you know, about art to keep people. I have a favorite art each day that I post in my social media, my favorite piece of art. And um, I actually enjoy your coffee breaks in the morning too, um, Alicia, because you are a fantastic watercolorist. Um, as is Sharon. Um, and so for me, it's, it's the art making and having that be a tool for me to liberate myself, to heal myself and to liberate other people is what keeps me, keeps me motivated. Um, and right now I'm artist in residence at the Center for Visual Artists. And I've uh, received a grant from Arts Greensboro to work on a digital monograph of my Fragile Heart series. So those are things that are really, that I, I'm focusing on um, right now, in addition to the Black Women's Art Collective. So, you know, lately doing a lot of soul work, um, I, you know, I've been hearing people talk about how the pandemic has been sort of apocalyptic in the sense that it has been an unveiling in terms of our systems and structures um, and to injustice, um, along with police brutality uh, against black and brown bodies coming to the surface. And for me, what I'm connecting to as well is what are my personal apocalyptic moments? And so I'm, I'm finding that I'm connecting those and expressing those because I, I feel like there's something there that's necessary for me to express. Um, and so having that sort of come together um, in my artwork, um, 
that self-discovery is, is, and being my most authentic self is kind of what, what I'm working on. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, Karen. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, Miss Sharon Larson, can you tell us what keeps you busy, who you are in this world? I can. And um, since Anessa brought up what sign she is, I'm supposedly a Leo and I don't really agree with that. I mean, my heart is pounding here as if, you know, I know most of you, but I don't love being the center of everyone's focus. I'd rather be the backup singer in the country music arena or the voice that reads audiobooks. <laughs> well, this is kind of hard for me, and I, I'm always shocked by that. I don't, I don't really know what I am, but I don't feel like a Leo. Um, anyway, Sharon Larson, and I'm from Iowa. Um, what keeps me busy now is drastically different than what kept me busy for most of my life. Um, I was a stay-at-home mom for, when do you stop? I mean, I've always been a stay-at-home mom, I guess. Um, our oldest is 25. And we are empty nesters now because all three kids are, are gone. But I still feel like I'm a stay-at-home mom on call. And just at the perfect time in 2014, which I can't believe that's eight years ago, I feel like it was yesterday, I took a watercolor class. And it was to me as, it felt as natural to me as being a mother and a homemaker and a wife. There's something just clicked. And long story short, here I am, a watercolor artist. Um, doing commissions of people's cats and dogs in their homes and their farms and um, loving it, loving it. And uh, I live on a farm. We have 110 acres and it's more of a hobby farm because we don't really rely on it to keep us afloat. But uh, I board horses for a couple of women and we have chickens and cows and many dogs and many cats. And as I get older, I think I can't keep this up anymore. So I'm very busy with that. And now uh, I guess I've always taught people how to paint watercolor, but with the pandemic, I had to stop, you know, teaching at colleges or bringing women into my home to teach. So it wasn't until Alicia had me at a sacred makers that I realized I don't have to stop teaching. And I cannot, I cannot tell you guys the joy it brings me to, to have people say, I've never painted before, I, I'm not creative. And then to watch them, like when we're on our Zoom calls, on our lessons, everybody's head is down. So all I see is this. And, and I'm watching all the tops of these heads and these women are like just focusing on, on what's in front of them. And they're all, I just feel like everyone's happy. And then they show me what they did. And like, I'm so happy at that moment that I could die and I fulfilled everything I've ever wanted to do in life. I know that sounds dramatic, but I love it. And I guess that's what keeps me busy. A little bit of everything. I love having options. I love that I can sit down and paint for a few hours and then I can, I don't know, go, I can go ride a horse if I want to ride a horse. It's been too cold, but hey, I can. And I love that I'm accessible to the family. Our oldest lives in the property next door with his fiance and soon to be baby. And like, that is my life and I love it. So there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So one of the themes that I'm already hearing um, with these three amazing women is all of them do love what they do. And all of them are passionate about the work um, that they're doing in the world. And I think that that's pretty darn amazing. Um, so that's the first theme that I see emerging. But because it's International Women's Day, I'm curious um, if each of you could share like 
what that means to you and why you think it's important. And Sharon, can I start with you? You can, but I was looking at the chat, so you have to repeat the question. <laughs> um, International Women's Day, yes. why is it important and what does it mean to you? Oh, geez. That's so tough. Okay, can I, can I be super, can I just be me? Please. I just have to be really honest here. Um, I have this weird outlook that isn't very popular in the world today. And I'm, I'm proud of women. I'm proud of men. It's really, it's hard for me to single out. It really is. I, so what does it mean to me? I, I've never felt, I, I have just never felt oppressed for being a woman. I never felt, this is really hard for me. I'm not even sure I should be answering this because I, I see such little distinction and I know that's not a popular answer. But that's what it means to you. That's what it means to me. And I remember when I first noticed that um, when I was an early artist, the gallery that I showed my art at would have um, Celebrate Women Artists Day. And I didn't go ever because I wanna be, I wanna be known for my art I, what are, are people shocked that I can paint because I have boobs? That was kind of my, like, hello, <laughs> I'm, I'm creative. And, and it's not because I'm a woman. And, and I get there's a history where women weren't, you know, prior weren't allowed to be artists. I understand that. But um, it isn't my story. So I'm, I'm passing it on to you other two ladies. <laughs> Well, I, I just think that that's really important because I think that we live in a time where um, I just, first of all, I appreciate you sharing your perspective honestly and open it and openly here because we do live in a time where there is, we're able to see things in a 360 view and we're able to see with 2020 vision, we're able to see back and front in a way that we weren't before. And it is not everyone's story. Um, and while that doesn't resonate with me, it doesn't negate that it's your story. And so if we, if we did try to tell you that that's not true for you, that's not right either, because that's what's true for you. So thank you. You're welcome. Karen, can you share? what International Women's Day means to you and why you feel like it's important? Mm. Um, I think it's a good question. I mean, I feel like I do enjoy celebrating women. Um, and I feel like for me, uh -oh. sorry, my friend, Teresa. <laughs> another, another fantastic woman, by the way. Um, I think it just means for me that um, I want to celebrate um, being a woman and, I, and, and celebrate women in general. And I think in terms of just naming the complexities of, of being a woman, it's a time to kind of um, shine a spotlight on what, you know, what our unique issues are, but also what our unique joys are as well. And so I see it as a, as a, just a, a day to, um, to celebrate us. And I enjoy, I enjoy, I've often joked and called myself gynocentric. <laughs> I enjoy, I really enjoy celebrating um, other women. And I mean that in the broadest um, sense of, of anyone who identifies um, as a woman um, and who can share a unique experience um, of that, so. That's a new word for me, gynocentric. I love it. I think I made it up, actually. <laughs> Karen, that's 
That's great. <laughs> Anessa, how about you? So International Women's Day to me is, I always sort of come back to trying to make inroads and push for women. And much like Karen said, women of anyone who identifies as a woman to push for them to have a place in leadership. So as a woman in tech, in corporate America, I don't know how many times I've been told to keep my head down, dull your shine, you know, don't talk in meetings, don't say the truth, don't act like you know it's happening even if you do more so than the CEO. Um, so many times in my career. And now for the last almost 10 years, I've been at those executive tables and I'm the person who says, that's not right. Um, you know, I've been the only woman at a lot of those executive tables and I've had to fill the space for women there. And I've had to make the space for other women to go there. And um, for me, we're not where we need to be yet, just as a society. We're not where we need to be on a lot of issues. But we're, at least for me, I'm trying to make inroads in my own life for other women to have those leadership roles, to be CEOs of company, to be COOs, to be heads of marketing, to be, and to be um, leaders, not only in the titles where women typically are leaders. So your, again, your, your CMOs, your chief people officers, they should be chief technology officers, chief product officers, chief financial officers, and um, chief executive officers, chief operating officers. And for me, International Women's Day means not being called honey in a hallway, not being told to smile more, but showing up as the woman that you are and not what the people think you're supposed to be or say or look like as a woman leader. And that is something that I celebrate every year. Um, and I think in, in you know, I don't know who, who kind of has read this article, but there's been several articles, most notably from the Harvard Business Review that have said that women are actually way better leaders than men on a lot of different functional areas. So for me, it's about celebrating that and using this day to push us all forward. And that's what it means to me. I remember Anessa when I was at um, the Fortune 500 company and I, um, I interviewed three different times for leadership roles. And um, I think that one of my strengths in personally is that um, I am a leader. I'm an encourager. I'm a coach. I do know how to get a desired outcome out of the folks on my team. And they told me that they were looking for a manager, not a coach. Um, and I, I felt like, uh, yeah, that said a lot about what was being looked for, but without saying the words. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I have that yeah, I, I have a lot to say about what, what you just said. That's probably not a, appropriate for me to go on. Right <laughs> well, I was, I, and for me, like, you know, when, when Kamala said, I'm speaking, I have had to say, I am speaking and I am not done in so many meetings. And whether that is a 70 year old billionaire or it's a 22 year old woman out of college, right? We all need to save space for each other and have that respect. And we're just not there yet as a society, especially in business. And um, I like to push the boundaries there. And I like to be outspoken. And I like to say things like Kamala did um, in her you know, debate and say, I'm speaking, I'm not done. You're going to wait. So um, for me, sometimes that's, that's the thrill of it. But <laughs> you know, I've, I've tried to make way for, for more people. And the rest of us reap the benefits of people like you that are comfortable saying those things. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Because I'm not always comfortable being the one to say that, even though I feel it. Um, so I appreciate you. Yeah. 
All right, I want to shift gears a little bit and I want to talk about, so Anessa, I don't know if you would identify this, but I, as an outsider looking, I, I don't know if you would identify as this, but as an outsider looking into your business, I, I see another through line with all three of you and it is creativity. And so even though your business is HR, I mean, to start a business, to be an entrepreneur, to it's creativity, right? Like you have to be a creative soul to mm -hmm. do those things. So I'm wondering, um, we've talked about this in some with some of you, but what does creativity mean to you? And why do you think it's important, especially where we are in the world today? And Anessa, I am gonna follow up with you on this one. I'm gonna go okay. with you next. So um, Alicia knows this just because um, she and I have spoken about this before, but I'm a former journalist. Um, I didn't start in HR, I didn't go to college for HR. I was a newspaper journalist and won a press award in North Carolina. Um, and it was a dying industry <laughs> when I got into it. Uh, there were not many family owned newspapers left. They were mostly owned by Gannett and Knight Ritter. Um, so I made a shift to HR, but what I went to school for and what is in my soul is writing and meeting people. So how I parlay that and how I think about creativity today in my business is I take that aspect of meeting with people and understanding people and trying to get what they are really motivated by and what they want in their work lives into changing or helping engage the culture of the workplaces that they are in. And also how each individual workplace has its own living, breathing culture that changes day to day. So I take that creativity from that and I use it in with every one of our clients. So, you know, a, a company that has 50 people in DC is going to look very different from a company who has 150 people across the street, right? There are different people in the company, therefore it is a different culture. And it is a different set of core values, a different set of how they work, a different set of, you know, um, unwritten rules that they all kind of go by or believe in. And I take that creativity in my day to day to figure out how to engage everyone and how to make their lives better, more fulfilling and more purposeful in their jobs. Because let's be honest, we spend a lot of time working. <laughs> So why not, you know, have fun doing it and why not do it in a place where you really enjoy each other and what you're working on. And so for me, that creativity comes from that. And also from how do we expand minds in a professional technical corporate setting to have diverse perspectives, right? So how do we shift, for instance, just taking normally Christian federal holidays as the list and how do we expand that? How do we expand that to include holidays from all religions? How do we uh, you know, talk about and getting vulnerable in our professional lives with each other so we can talk about race and belonging and perspectives? And how do we extend that through to not only our work lives, but to our friends and our family, and then also circle back, right? Because I think we've all kind of learned this year that there were people who super compartmentalized those things. That car compartmentalization hasn't been able to be as effective over the last year because we're in the same place. We're all on Zoom and families are behind us and whatever else is happening in our lives, everyone sees it. And so the creativity that I previously had as a writer, I now channel to cultural initiatives and change initiatives in organizations. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Thanks. Sharon. Tell us about creativity for you. <laughs> Mine's going to sound very little house in the prairie like now. <laughs> um, you know, I, it's funny when I think back, I used to tell people that I wasn't creative. I remember thinking that and fully believing that I am not a creative person. And that's because I was measuring it by output and what I actually had in front of me that I could show somebody. And, and not just art, but anything. And one of my first memories of being creative was writing a little poem. And, and I still love to write. 
but I showed it to my dad and there was a word in there that he did not agree with. And it wasn't a cuss word. He just, it wasn't a happy word. And I got in trouble for it. And that was my first like, oh, there's rules with creativity. And actually there's not, <laughs> that's the big secret. Uh, but for as long as I can remember, and I still do it now, you guys can all picture this if you want to, it's fine. But when I go outside to do chores later tonight, I will always make up a Disney song of my own <laughs> when I walk out there. I'm always, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm either singing or I'm humming something I made up or I'm writing something or um, the way I look at things is different. And then that's what I try to teach in my classes. You know, the shadows on snow is not like gray. Come on, look at it. It's like a bright blue on a sunny day. Just your, your brain is telling you snow is white. But if you get really in touch with that inner creative voice, um, the truth comes out. So creativity to me, I can't even think of a minute during my day anymore where I'm not creative and it drives my husband nuts and me nuts because he does not, he does not understand my creativity. You know, he's all columns and rows and, and super high end business. And he's creative in that venue where I'm not. And, but I'm creative in a totally different way. Just the things that I imagine and the Oh, the analogies that I come up with, it's just these mental images are always flowing out of me. Mm -hmm. Sharon, tonight, before I go to bed, I'm going to try to think of a Disney song. I'm going to try to make up my own Disney song, and it is going to be because of you. <laughs> now, remember that I live with no one around except for my son, who's a neighbor, and then some neighbors I don't really care about. And, and I can do that. <laughs> don't yeah, get I alone. I can do that too, right? <laughs> outside? Yeah, I could probably do that outside too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want you to record it, Alicia, so we can all hear it. <laughs> you actually don't want me to do that, but... <laughs> <laughs> we have so many parameters and I get that not everyone can walk outside to their mailbox, you know, wearing whatever you slept in. I, I understand that not everyone can do that. Um, but there are times when, when we have self-inflicted parameters that keep our creativity hold up. And, and that's what I would want people to really recognize a difference. Okay, yeah, you can't go out in your underwear to get the mail, but what can you do here? You can, there's options, guys. There's always options. Before a certain someone moved next door, I would often go outside in my pajamas to move things around, like to bring the trash can back in and whatnot. I, I might look a little bit better now, but yeah, I, I, even in the city, you can do that too, depending on where your shame level is. <laughs> and how much you think of your neighbors. And how much you think of your neighbors. <laughs> Karen, tell us creativity. What is it for you? Why is it important? I love this segue from Cher because, you know, creativity to me is a liberatory thing. It's a, and for me, in terms of who I am and what I do, like I, I have, um, when I, when I've, uh, invite people to come draw with me people will say oh they'll say I'm just warning you I can't draw and I came to realize what that meant was that I can't recreate something accurately or perfectly that I see and what I would say to people is that's only one really narrow form of drawing there's lots of mark making that is beautiful and so what I my goal is liberating people from that judgment because it's it's like Sharon said it's limiting and when they come I give I would usually give art prompts um, and also at the library when I did two public art practice special sessions where I focused on uh, black women artists in an art talk and then I use their work as prompts 
um, for a community painting event where we rotate canvases and paint on each other's canvases. Like people, um, people would say, and, and they've said this about sessions at Deep Roots, like they feel an opening, like they feel a, an inner, creativity is about, to me, a liberatory effort in creating this inner spaciousness. And that's when you can create that inner spaciousness, it's something that you, you, can, you can process and you, you want that inner spaciousness in the, on the outside too for other people. So this is a, this is a self-liberation effort and liberatory effort for other folks and watching people rotate on their canvases and you could feel people are tense at first wondering what folks are gonna draw or paint on their canvases. And then when they return to it, I have them return to their original canvas and finish it up, give it a name and say what they love about it in a celebratory discussion. Folks are like, I love what she did here. I would never have thought of that. And I love what they did. Like people see that the sum of the parts or you know, the whole is greater than just the sum of the parts that things happen that they could not have even imagined and it's created something you know, even more beautiful. And I, you know, I say to people, folks, if folks get this tense with just some painting on people's canvases, you know they're getting tense. We get tense in other situations in terms of letting go. So for me, get, and giving giving people those prompts and also um, affirming what they're doing. So that is, to me is part of the liberation when you have someone who not only gives you the tools, or gives you through a process, gives prompts, but then you know, for example, I had a woman. Um, friend of mine, she's actually part of the Black Women's Art Collective now. She's a scientist. She came and I gave her a prompt of fragmented, fragmented and mosaic. And she did this beautiful piece. And I looked at it and I said, do you know the artist Mido, the Spanish painter Mido? And she was like, no. And I looked it up on my iPad and I showed it to her and she gasped. She went, oh, I said, your work looks like Mido's. <laughs> and she was like, oh, it does. So people think they can't do, it's like, here's this painter, you're doing something that uh, is, you know, as good, if you wanna use the word good, like every, everyone has, so to me, creativity is life, is freedom, it's fundamentally who we are. Mm. It's what brought us into the world, <laughs> an act of creation. So the fomenting of it, the fermenting and fomenting and encouraging and liberating that creative spirit is like, for me, creativity is like the center of everything. And it is, it is what all else springs forth from. Mm. So I want to nourish, uh, encourage and nourish it, you know, as much as I can in myself for that inner spacious and for that, that liberation of self and others. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love that. Um, okay, so I, I, again, shifting gears a little bit, although I do think that this plays a lot into creativity. Um, you know, one of my all-time favorite um, podcasts is How I Built This. I'm, I'm so fascinated with how entrepreneurs build things. And uh, an episode that particularly stands out to me is Sarah Blakely. She's the one that started Spanx and she talks about how at her dinner table as a child, her father would ask her and her sibling, you know, what did you fail at today? And it was celebrated because it meant you were trying. Um, not having something that you failed at was the bigger problem. Um, because it meant that you didn't try hard enough. And I don't love Spanx. I don't really love necessarily the concept around Spanx. Don't constrict me. Don't constrict my body. <laughs> like, like, don't make me take up less space. I want to take up all the space I want to take up. But I love Sarah Blakely. She's built an empire. She's clearly doing something right. So so that that's an issue I feel slightly conflicted on, but I love what she's doing. And so in the spirit of that, um, I'm curious, uh, in the wise woman interview that I would do, I would, I would typically always ask like, what's something that you like either made a misstep 
misstep at recently or something you felt like you failed at recently and what did you learn and why was it important and um Karen I'm gonna have you next um unless you need to punt this and think about it but I'm gonna have all of you answer okay so, oh you're on mute again sorry no no that's no that's problem oh, here you go. um yeah I wrote a grant that I didn't get and um here's the here's the the so many beautiful things about it because it was for the black women's art collective and i the it was an open grant process open grant review process in that people who applied for it were invited to attend a zoom call to see the review of your grant <clears throat> and um that was in in the 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 um creative ceo for greensboro he came by the CVA the night before the grant panel. And he was like, I'm gonna see you tomorrow, right? You're gonna be on? And I said, yeah. And um, he said, just be ready. You know, um, it, this is a this is an open process. They saved me. I said, oh, that's fine. And he he said the same thing again when they opened it up. And, and they were honest <laughs> and forthright. And I realized for myself, one, I gave the group the wrong name. Um, I had called it a marketing group, really what it was more of a collective was a better word than mark because marketing implies, oh, you're just trying to sell your work. And I'm like, no, this is us getting together to create and, and exhibit. And if they sell as well, because we, you know, the plan is to share in our networks, that's fine. So gave it the wrong name. Um, you know, and two, that I had not, I was on the call for the uh, sort of a prep conversation for people who wanted to apply. And there were only like four other people on. And I, I, I had to make, I had to admit to myself, and this was, I think, proved true. The pan, I, had not, I had not seen it as competitive. And I don't think I put the care and attention into it that I deserved. And there were some women I had asked to take part. I should have listed them. And I looked at the details that I left and I thought to myself, see, that was, that was a huge take, step back, don't rush through things, take the care and attention to it, regardless of who else you think is applying, regardless of whether it's small or big, you know, grant that, that reminder um, for the care and attention and just sharing details I already knew. Why, I thought, I said, why didn't I just put those women's names in there? So it was a really good lesson for me, reminding me for, to put that care and attention to things. And um, so I'm like, I went ahead and started the collective anyway on my own. And it, my goal is to, to get more grant funding for it, but that was, just, that was a good lesson. And it was, it was, I sent a thank you letter, you know, to the creative CEO to say thank you for uh, letting me sit in. It was insightful, it was honest, it was pointed, it was helpful. And um, he was like, you know, thanks. Well, I'm sure we're gonna see you again. And, and so I appreciated that. So it's, wow. it's, it's actually good to see when things are, you know, um, within your control and your influence. Karen, that's, thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, what's also cool about that is that they did an open review like that. Um, I applied, when I was working for Triad Local First and trying to get their women independent business owners network um, off the ground that year, we applied to over four different grants and none of them had transparent um, reviews like that. And so I would always follow up and ask like why, but I never felt like I got the real answer of why we got denied for those grants. Um, mm -hmm. And so it would have been really amazing to have been like a fly on the wall. It would have, what you learned, that's so cool. Thank you for sharing that. We relatedly, thank you for, for mentioning that because I think this is a new creative officer um, in Greensboro, and he says he wants to make them even more open for the public. That's his goal, he's got to work through it. And also, um, another grant I didn't get when I, I actually, the person reached out and said, I want to meet with you 
and go over it and give you insight, it was so helpful because I did what she told me to do. <laughs> and then the next time I applied, I got the grant. <laughs> so yeah, so that feedback, those reminders for feedback or so whether it's, it, it might sting a little, you know, but it's just, it's so helpful because now I, you know, you know what to do. Yeah. And that spirit of collaboration, right? Like that idea, one of the things that I typically talk about, like I sign a lot of my emails, we rise by lifting others like that, ex that hand extended of like, let's meet, let's talk about this. Or, or even the guy who's saying like, let's make it open. Let's make it transparent. That's, we all rise when that's that, the process is that transparent. That's amazing. So thank you. Um, Anessa, how about you? A time that there was maybe a, a misstep. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I think starting your own business as an entrepreneur, there's a lot of missteps along the way that you figure out. Um, one of my early failures, and I'll do an early failure and then a more recent failure. One of my early failures was um, not putting everything in writing and contracts. So not making space for myself in contracts, um, relying too much on what they said they would do, things like that. Um, I've started to put, oh gosh, probably the last five years, I've put um, vacation dates, deviceless vacation dates in contracts so that they, I won't be there. I'm not a full-time employee. You can't reach me. I'm a consultant. Sorry, I'm out. <laughs> um, and in HR, that's a tough thing, right? We probably did that a little less so this year because the world was on fire. Um, but um, that was an early lesson for me. I started to add more and more things into contracts. Um, I've One thing I would say is my recent failure, not super recent, but I would say it's, it's a reminder of me this year, we had to fire a client this time last year. Um, I've had to fire clients before, I've probably fired four clients in the years that I've had a, a business. Um, and the client this time last year was a, was a client that would have, that we would have made $80,000 on. And um, I decided as a, the CEO of my business, we were working with a company. Um, it was actually my husband's first client since he joined my business first time. And he said to me, I can work with these people if you want me to work with these people, but it's your business, it's your decision. And um, we fired this tech company because the CEO wouldn't um, acknowledge things I said in meetings would look to my husband as he was the owner of the business. Um, when I made recommendations, he didn't listen. And so I had a conversation with him and I said, what are we here for? Do you want me to be a yes woman? What am I here for? And he said, oh, you're here to help us with people operations and scaling our business. And, and, and I said, great, I'm gonna need you to look at me then. And I'm gonna need you to listen to me in meetings. And he said, well, I do that all the time. Why, would, why wouldn't I do that? I teach at Georgetown. I'm a law professor at Georgetown and this and that. And I'm like, but you're not listening. And you're being, a, you know, you're, I had to say, I said, I'm going to give you some really hard feedback if you're ready for it. And he said, yes. And I said, you're being a little bit sexist. And I'm going to need you to back that down quite a bit if we're going to work together. And he said to me, I don't, you know, he called me all the names in the book. And I said, okay, great. Well, you can, you can scale your business yourself and we're walking away. And um, he said to me, well, we need your help. We need you to grow. Can't you help us for two more weeks? No, I can't because my time is worth more than this. And so um, for me, the, the reminder constantly is there's a lot of people out there that are receptive and want to get better. There are still some pretty blatant sexist leaders of companies that don't want to get better and don't care and just want to check boxes and say that they're doing things. Those people aren't for us. And I'm going to go spend my time where I can make an impact. Like so, that's my lesson. <laughs> 
type of thing. Yeah. So I'm like, I, you know, I could have stuck it out. I could have done it, but it's not worth it. Right. At the end of the day. So um, it's actually, it's, it's funny and not funny. Literally right before this call tonight, uh, a friend of mine that works at another company that's one of our clients has decided, and I just found this out today, that she's going to that company. And she texted me and said, I saw they were a client of yours. I'm about to make the announcement tomorrow that I'm leaving. Is there anything I should know? And I said to her, this is like very, you like, you know, like karma, right? I said, I, we need to talk tonight before you announce because she's going to go be chief of staff for this person. And she needs to know. <laughs> right? And so it's like, it's so funny, like how this works, but it's just a really interesting dynamic of like, oh, well, the world is so small. <laughs> so that's, that's why, that's why lesson in failure is sometimes you have to fail to, um, and let go of money, let go of a client and just let it go because they're not for you. Um, to, to go on to the next person who is for you, so. Thank you for sharing that. Sharon, how about you? Well, Anessa, that sounds like a win. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> was. My husband was like, thank you for, for not having me work with them. Like, yeah, you're that's, welcome. <laughs> that's great, kudos to you, that's awesome. Uh, so before I, I talk about that, if everyone could be like super honest for a second, because I am going to raise my hand after I ask this question, but how many of you women here can say that you are pretty much good at almost everything that you try to do? I mean, I'm not the only one. Come on. No. <laughs> what do you mean? No. Sure. Can you like, not? you feel like you're good at most things that you try. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did I word oh, that funny? Was that my, did I word it weird? Cause I'm like, I'm not going to be the only hand up. <laughs> I would say it depends. Like if anyone wants me to sing, they're just going to go the other way. But <laughs> well, Oh no, I guess I wasn't picturing that. But, but for instance, um, I do a lot of things when my husband's out of town because he, his first answer to something is no. And so I'll wait for you to go and I'm going to do it all myself. And one of these things was a chicken coop. No, we're not getting chickens. No one's allergic to them. No one's going to get hurt. We're getting chickens. I'm going to do it when you're in China. When you come back, there's nothing you can do about it. So I just knew how to put together this chicken coop. And I knew how to make pans to hold, you know, all their droppings when they roosted. And I knew how to make the nesting boxes. And I, and then every paying job I had in the past, I always did really well. I mean, just, I could, I don't know why I'm not bragging. I'm just saying I could do really well at most tasks given to me, uh, unless it involves directions or numbers. But uh, so what I was going to say is the definition of fail to me is different. I really don't feel like I ever fail unless like I know when I'm failing when I'm doing something that goes against who I am. So every single time that I took a job, this is when the kids were maybe in junior high, that I thought was an adult job, you know, which meant me having a boss and getting a paycheck and having responsibilities that I had to do before I could leave. Um, every time I tried to do that route, and I felt like I was getting further and further away from who I am, that's a fail. Mm. And so now I have not failed. Oh wait, no, I did fail recently. Um, Alicia rescued me from that one, but <laughs> I took this, <laughs> this part-time job that I thought I would love and yeah. And then I realized it gave no time for me to be who Sharon Larson is. So I'm now a pro at listening to that voice in my head. We have a lot of talks. We have a lot of check-ins. How are you doing? I'm my own boss. I'm giving my own reviews to myself. I, I need those performance reviews for myself. And mainly I'm asking, how do you feel way in here? Are you, do you love this class you're teaching? 
because I almost taught a class that I was not excited about. And some gracious people gave me permission to just wipe it off my website and not do it. And I'm so glad, or that might've been a fail. Mm. It might've been, but I yeah. love that. This is why I love panels. And now I'm like sad that um, I haven't done more of them because everybody has such unique and interesting and impactful answers to this. And it's all something like each of them have a nugget for us in there. And I love it. So thank you. And I'm just going to say, I'm sorry in advance, because I thought we'd be wrapping up right about now, but I really want to open it up for about 10 minutes of Q and A. So, um, okay. If you have a question, you can raise, raise your hands. You can literally raise your hands or you can do the raise your hand on the zoom, which I still haven't figured out myself. So you can actually raise your hand if you want to. Any questions? Miriam. Karen, my question is to you. I'm wondering what's the first thing that you do with someone who says um, that they can't create, they can't draw, and then they come up with Jean Miro. <laughs> now, what would, do you mind telling me just one or two things that you do first? But you're on mute. <laughs> um, I give a variety of art prompts. So they have something to choose to see what resonates with them. And they're usually something like sort of conceptual, but all and, and visual. So that kind of concrete and then more, um, less concrete, more concrete. And then um, I offer them an unconventional tool. I think a lot of people get intimidated by a paintbrush or something that they see as conventional. And in my own artwork, I use dollar store makeup sponges. Um, I use the caps from, you know, if you get a four pack of beer, there's like a plastic, somebody from Deep Roots walked over to me with a bag of tops and said, I was gonna recycle these, but I feel like you'll know what to do with them. Um, and there's actually like, there's a painting on my website right now <laughs> that I started with dipping that in ink. Um, Sharon, I remember Sharon at Happy Hour pulled out a piece of tissue paper. Cause she asked me actually this, a similar question about what I do to kind of get my creativity going, my feeling stuck. And I say, oh, I pick an unconventional tool. Um, as of late, I've been using pipettes, which are made out of glass, usually used in a lab. I got a bunch of them for 10 cents a piece at Reconsidered Goods. So it's kind of like making my own ink pen and I dip it in the ink. And so it's open at the end and it sucks up a little. And then I take it and I make a mark with it and the ink flows out at its own rate. Or I give up the tools altogether. Um, and I just tip, tip the paper, drip, um, bend. Um, that's kind of how I've um, done the Fragile Heart Collection. So. I give people a variety of art prompts to see what resonates. I give them something they're not familiar with, an unconventional tool that's not even typically artsy. And then I'm there with them making so they kind of can feed off my vibe to where I'll say something like, you know, you know, I'm just gonna, I'll give myself an art prompt of um, make a pattern you know, so I'm gonna make a pattern or so some, some sort of art prompt they can relate to. So those are kind of my three, my three techniques. Thank you very much. It's mm -hmm. fascinating. Kudos to Sharon. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I remember that moment too. <laughs> yeah, and I'll say um, for those of you who are members of the gathering um, on Mighty Networks, you can go back to um, previous Sacred Maker happy hours and check out Karen's and, and join us on that one. Liz, you have your hand raised. I'm going to go to you next. Yes. Just so you know, you go to the reactions and it says raise hand. So that's where yeah. you go. Um, I would just be curious for the three of you, for our three panelists, what do you do um, to recharge, just self-care? Like how do you just, because um, you're all doing amazing things and have lots on your plate. So what do you do for that? I'll say, Karen, we'll start with you on that one. 
Yeah. Um, I like to meditate. Um, I have um, a few, um, it's a chakra healing Spotify list. I like Beautiful Chorus. If you know them, they have a lot of good, you just look them up on YouTube. They have a lot of good um, songs that are designed for meditation. And um, I also, I have a favorite, per, one person I follow on social media, Lama Rod. Um, he gives talks, Dharma talks, and then he'll usually meditate within the talks as well. So that's something that I do. Also, I, I'm a big napper. <laughs> I love napping. Um, it really rejuvenates me, especially if I've been up. Sometimes I'm working late, you know, at, at night. Um, and then, and then sometimes it just doing something that is just, if I'm feeling tired or frustrated, like sometimes I just need to do something mindless, you know, clean or, you know, what, you know, wash dishes or clean or straighten up, meet my environment, something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sharon, how about you? Animals. Animals, animals, animals. <laughs> uh, it's hard in this, the winter, my horses are like lawn mowers. We put them away or I put, I'm the only one who rides. So I do nothing with them, but keep them alive all winter, give them a little snack and a little pet in the face. But uh, gosh, without my animals, I don't know how I'd recharge. I just, horses, that's, yeah. Very therapeutic. Thank you. Anessa, how about you? I have a lot of ways. <laughs> Give them to us. Bring them on. All right. Well, pre-pandemic, I am a big massage getter. It is the only way for my body to release all of its tension, typically. Um, and like, I love a spa day. I'd love to be in a sauna. I love to get a massage. I love to do that. Um, have not had one in over a year. <laughs> so, sure got mega knots happening. Um, so, but during the pandemic, um, things that I see as self-care is in the morning, taking time for myself and blocking out time and having a cup of coffee, reading a book and a um, magazine getting a FaceTime with girlfriends or with a around a fire pit and laughing, socially distanced, of course. Um, having my like TV time and the evenings with my husband and wine. So just kind of like veg out with wine. Um, and then for me, it's also sometimes just being quiet with my own thoughts. So leaving space for nothing, it literally will block out time on my calendar for that. Um, and um, I'm not a good meditation person. My mind has a million things running through it. I can never actually quiet it. Um, I start, I don't know, I'm in the midst of reading eight books. Like I start books, I don't always finish them at the same time. Um, I constantly are, I'm trying to read a bunch of things that I feel like I need to read at the time. And somehow the universe sends me in the right direction of what I need to read in a book to give me an answer at that time. Um, so like what I'm reading right now is a mix of Make Life Beautiful, the Studio McGee book with 400 Souls by Abram Kenzie. And then, um, the Barack Obama promised land and a book that a friend of mine just wrote, uh, Michael Slaby called for all the people he was with, uh, he was Barack Obama's, uh, head of digital. And I would say the last thing for me, self-care is a glass of wine or, um, some Nika coffee whiskey, which I'm not really a whiskey fan, but I like that whiskey in a bubble bath. So lots of ways. I've tried lots of ways. <laughs> oh, and, and then just walking, like being in nature at some point is good for me too. That's awesome. Thank you so much. 
Um, I, I want to be really cognizant of time. And so I'm going to wrap us up in just a few minutes. But before I do wrap us up, I hope that you all have enjoyed being here tonight and taking part in this panel. This community is so beautiful and so wonderful. And I just love um, the different voices and perspectives that are always present in this community. Um, if you want to join us on um, a more intimate level, you can always come visit RAW before you join. So if you are not currently a member of RAW and you want to come visit, just shoot me an email and we'll work out a day and I'll make sure that you can come visit if you haven't already. So just shoot me an email, let me know if you wanna visit RAW. Um, also, um, yeah, if you want to follow up with questions, let me know. Otherwise, this particular panel will most likely be next week's podcast. So just um, that'll be coming out next week. Tomorrow, uh, I highly recommend listening to the podcast that will be out. It's it's on iTunes now, but I always publicize it on Tuesday. It is um, Robin Geigel has a debut novel out called By Way of Sorrow. And she is, um, this, this book is a thriller, it's fantastic. And she tells her story of transitioning, or not her story, but a story of transitioning um, through this character. And it's just, it's phenomenal. So I could not put this book down. It was really exciting for me to interview this particular author. She's an author, an activist. Um, so, Check that out tomorrow in, in the podcast. Um, okay, now I'm going to wrap us up with our with the very last question that I ask everyone um, a part of this community, um, and 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 we'll let's try to keep it to thirty seconds for our answer. Anessa, how do you live a life of abundance? Oh gosh, um, I live a life of abundance by trying to be in the most grateful, gracious, and positive attitude that I can, mm. which gives me time to when I have times where I can't be in that, I feel it. I feel it for a minute deeply, and then I'm out of it. Um, so I give it time, I pause, but then for most of the time, I would say like 85% of the time, I'm a pretty optimistic person. So I try to always constantly feel grateful and gracious to um, everything that I have and everything that I'm doing. I'm, I'm not a um, religious person. I'm more kind of agnostic to things. Um, I know there's a higher power, but I, I don't know what it's called or who it is or what it is. Um, so I wouldn't say like hashtag blessed, but same type of thing. Thank you. Karen, how do you live a life of abundance? Bringing my full self to everything that I do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sharon, how do you live a life of abundance? I live a life of abundance by surrounding myself with a lot of options. And all the options have to be some piece of me because I'm not one thing, I'm many. So I need something to match with all those different parts of who I am. Thank you. So a huge thank you to our panelists for being here tonight. Thank you to all of you that came and hung out and, and brought your energy tonight with us. Um, if you have any questions about the community, don't hesitate to reach out to shoot me an email. And um, just, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye everyone.